Hello, welcome back. As we continue in our series on the armour of God, we're up to number six right now, and this talk is on how to defend yourself against the father of lies. How to defend yourself against the lies of Satan. And so I want to read to you from, actually from the book of Genesis, right back in the start of the Bible, because this uh, issue with Satan being the father of lies has been with us for as long as the human race has been around. And this is a great example of that. It's Genesis chapter three and verses one to, to 13. Now, the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord had made. He said to the woman, did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? But the woman said to the serpent, we may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, but God did say, you must not eat from the fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden and you must not touch it or you will die. You'll not certainly die, the serpent said to the woman, for God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be opened and you'll be like God, knowing good and evil. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband, who was with her, and he ate it. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they realised that they were naked, so they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord, uh, the Lord God, as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and they hid from the Lord among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man, Where are you? And he answered, I heard you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. And he said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree that I commanded you not to eat from? The man said, oh, What the woman you put here with me, she gave me some fruit from the tree, and I ate it. Then the Lord God said to the woman, What is this you have done? The woman said, The serpent deceived me. And I ate it. So if you were to ask, uh, I don't know, say a hundred people at random, what they thought the purpose of Christianity is, I wonder what answers you'd get. Maybe it would be something like, well, it makes you a better person or it makes you feel better, maybe. I have to say that probably the experience of most people who've gone occasionally to church is it's irrelevant and it's condemning and it's after your money. Maybe people would answer, well, it's all about giving people a crutch to lean on if they can't cope with real life. Probably the answers that you got would be broadly along those lines. If people uh, through that thought that there was any point to it at all, that's probably what they'd say. Well, almost certainly you'd not get the answer the point of Christianity is to enter into battle with Satan and his demonic hosts with the goal of enforcing on earth that which has already been declared in heaven. Now, my guess is that uh, not many people would find their thoughts turning to that. And partly, at least, that is because Satan, who is called the father of lies, has been remarkably successful in convincing people that he doesn't exist at the same time as inflicting incredible suffering on the earth. It's amazing how we can see incredible suffering, but the majority would say that the idea of a personal devil is ridiculous. And if he has been successful in denying his existence to the world in general, he's been incredibly successful in doing that in the church. For example, what are the two most contested books in the Bible? Well, the first is Genesis and the second is Revelation. The first book deals with the subject of creation. The second book deals with the subject of the end times. And both are hugely controversial subjects. But the reality is what that first book deals with is where sin came from in the first place. And the second deals with what the final destiny of Satan is. So if you look at the controversies surrounding the books of Genesis and Revelation from the point of view of 
Who would have the most to gain from those books not being taken seriously? You realize, well, that's Satan. Genesis tells us whose fault it is, whose fault it is. Revelation tells us what's going to happen to him. And so Satan has managed to confuse Christians regarding those things and regarding their standing before God. He's managed to convince Christians that they can lose their salvation. What an incredibly crazy doctrine to believe. But some Christians do. And he's convinced others that God has got a select few to save, the predestined ones. And if your name is not pre-written in heaven, then you are already doomed, consigned to hell. <laughs> no wonder, as Paul uses the analogy of the Roman soldier's armour, no wonder he says, put on salvation as your helmet. It's to protect ourselves from allowing Satan to mess with our minds. Now, why is that important? Because of a well-known verse in Proverbs 4. Be careful what you think because your life is shaped by your thoughts. Now, this is true. We act out what we believe. For example, if you lay a plank of wood on the floor, you'll have, a, you'll have very little difficulty walking along that plank. If you take that same plank and you place it 100 feet in the air, and someone says to you, walk along that plank, suddenly it's only a fraction of the width that it was before, and you feel very unsteady as you step out onto it. Same plank, but in a very different context. We look at it now and we say, that's impossible to balance on, and we act out of that belief. We act out what we allow into our minds. If you look at it and say, it can't be done, then we act it out. Consequently, if we let the evil one into our mind, planting seeds of doubt and despair, we will start to act out those beliefs. Now, how does he do that? And how do we ensure that he can't? It's really quite crucial to know, and it's what we're looking at in this installment of the armor of God. Actually, the passage that I've just read reveals three favorite strategies of Satan that he uses to great effect. But with God's help, we can overcome each one of them. We can see Satan's ability to mess with our minds dramatically reduced and even cut out. It all depends on having the helmet of salvation in place so that we can't get into and he can't get into and mess with our minds. Now, why this is so crucial is that many, many Christians have allowed Satan to mess with their minds. So what's Satan's first strategy for doing that? Well, it's this, exaggeration. The most effective lie is the truth, but the truth exaggerated out of all proportion. Most heresy has truth as its starting point. It's just that it's focused on too much to the exclusion of other aspects of the truth, and it's elevated too much, and so it becomes heresy. So Satan's first strategy is planting a seed of doubt in Eve's mind that would lead to a disastrous separation between Adam and Eve and God. Now, the serpent was the sh shrewdest of creatures that the Lord God had made. Really? He asked the woman. Did God really say that you must not eat of any of the fruit of the garden? Well, the answer to that, of course, is no. God never said that. That's not what God said at all. But Satan isn't interested in the truth. He's interested in taking something that God said and twisting and exaggerating that to the extent that it sounds outrageous. In that sense, he is the father of all conspiracy theories. With a conspiracy theory, there's a kernel of truth, but it's made into something blown out of all proportion, that, that the, so the results aren't true. Satan's exaggeration draws Eve into making a response. Of course we may eat it. 
It's only the fruit of the tree at the center of the garden that we may not eat. Now, what she should have said was, I want nothing to do with you. I don't even want to enter into a conversation with you. But because of Satan's exaggeration, he achieved what he wanted, a conversation into which he could pour further lies. He then went from an exaggeration to an outright lie. You won't surely die. God knows your eyes will be opened when you eat it. You won't die is an outright lie. You will die. This is how death is introduced into humanity. Exaggeration, conversation, lie. This is how Satan does it. This is what he uses. Exaggeration, conversation, lie. Now, you can see this happening in our lives. Here's how, here's how it goes. Someone is a bit sharp with you, uh, say at church on a Sunday. They say something uh, that, that may sound a bit unkind. And you go home where you start playing things over in your mind. And every time you do, it gets bigger and bigger. You talk about it with someone else. And as you recount what happened, you recount the words that uh, that other person used, but you inject your own emphases into, into uh, your voice. Maybe aggression. So now they're saying those words, but they're saying them aggressively. Maybe sarcasm. Maybe now they're saying it really sarcastically. Maybe offhandedness. We go into impersonations and then swiftly into caricatures. Because this is how we heard it in our minds and we have rehearsed it and it's got bigger and bigger. And so by the time we tell someone else about it, the original person has been absolutely outrageous. And the whole thing just grows and grows until you are very, very angry. Now, Part of that is our own damage and fragile self-esteem. Part of it is our own sinfulness in that, frankly, there's a certain satisfaction and enjoyment in nursing it and rehearsing it. We do it because we want to, we like it. And part of it is Satan stoking the fire saying, did they really say, really? Are you gonna stand for that? They deserve whatever they have coming to them. Stoking the fires, adding fresh aspects of the conversation that you hadn't even realized before, but just a minute, now I think about it, this isn't the first time they've been rude to me. It gets bigger and bigger in our mind. Now, why don't we just say to Satan, Satan, I am not having this conversation with you for the same reason that Eve didn't. He hooks us and draws us in with his exaggerations. It's a subtle tactic and it gets us every time. It messes with our minds so that we lose sight of balanced reality. No wonder the Bible warns us, be alert, be on watch. Your enemy Satan roams around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. How does having the, the helmet of salvation firmly in place help us to stand against this tactic? How can we stop Satan messing with our minds in this way? Knowing the truth and allowing the truth to set us free. The result of listening to Satan's exaggeration is that we get an exaggerated view of the situation and an exaggerated view of ourselves. We see ourselves as completely the innocent party, which leads us to moral outrage. Or we see ourselves as worse than we really are. We embrace Satan's lies about ourselves. Knowing the truth and the truth setting us free is about knowing the truth of how God sees us. Not swallowing Satan's exaggeration, but knowing the truth of how God sees us. As God's messenger, I give each of you this warning, the Bible says. Be honest in your estimate of yourselves, measuring your value by how much faith 
God has given you. In other words, you can measure yourself according to Satan's exaggeration, or you can measure yourself according to the faith that God has given you. Our true identity will only be found in Christ. We'll only truly discover who we are when we go to God and ask him to show us the truth. Now, like I say, Satan's exaggerations lead us in two ways. He pursues those ways strategically. The first strategy we just looked at is exaggeration. The second strategy coming out of that is the amplification of our low self-esteem. Our low self-esteem is amplified. He picks on our low self-esteem and he amplifies it. Just see how this plays out in the conversation that Satan brings Eve into. You won't die, the serpent hissed. God knows that your eyes will be opened when you eat it. You will become just like God, knowing good and evil. In other words, God is deliberately keeping you in the dark. God doesn't trust you. God doesn't want you to fulfill your full potential. You're a second class citizen in his eyes. He wants to keep you down. Now, why is this strategy so effective? Because it connects with a secret struggle that most of us have, that we don't really think that we're much good. Actually, that's where most people are. They don't think they are much good. Most of us, when we fail at something, it just confirms what we suspected all along, that we're failures. So Satan, in the guise of being the serpent, just quietly presses the button, knowing that having planted that seed, it would bear fruit and Eve would be easy to convince. It's one of Satan's most effective strategies, the amplification of our low self-esteem. Here's how he does it. <clears throat> he takes the thing that we are most passionate about and he gets someone to convince us that we are a failure at it. Now for Eve, it was community with God. For you, that could be something entirely different. Satan targets our biggest passion and fires an arrow at it, knowing it will cause maximum damage to our self-esteem. How can we stand against this strategy? Again, by knowing the truth and allowing the truth to set us free. When the arrow goes into the place where we feel most passionate about, and we find ourselves going rapidly downhill, here's the truth that we need to hold on to. For we are God's masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus so that we can do the things that he planned for us long ago. We can do it in his strength. And that allows us to fill our minds with the truth that God created me and he placed this passion in me and I just have to be faithful in it and leave the results to him. I don't have to be brilliant. I have to be faithful and allow the Holy Spirit to bring amazing fruit out of it. That's what it means to have the helmet of salvation in place. When I allow that verse to fill my mind, Satan can't mess with my mind and plant the seed of doubt that I have deluded myself all along about what I feel most passionately about. It's what you feel most passionately about that you are most vulnerable in. Ask yourself this, what is it that you feel most passionately about? What most effectively knocks you off your feet when you think you are failing at that particular thing. Listen, that is the very thing that Satan is going to target. That is his strategy. And it's a, it's a very short distance from feeling that we are failing at the thing we are most passionate about to wanting to give up because we are failures. Know the truth and the truth will set you free. You are God's 
masterpiece. He created you anew in Christ Jesus so that you can do the good things that he planned for you long ago. The truth is, God took care in creating you. You're not useless or defective. Don't let Satan mess with your mind on this one. Don't let him amplify your low self-esteem. Now, the other way his exaggerations go, that first way was about exaggerating your low self-esteem, the other way is that he plays on our pride. He follows the line that is most effective. For some, that is pressing the button that leads to low self-esteem. For others, he presses the button that leads to pride. The pride of self-sufficiency. Now, that's what now happens with Eve. He exaggerates God's restrictions by insinuating, by making out that what he heard was that God wouldn't let them eat any fruit. That's the updated version of events. That's what I've heard, uh, says Satan. And seeing as they're both vegetarians at this stage, Adam and Eve, this is a big problem. He presses Eve's self-esteem button by suggesting that God has been misleading her in terms of keeping her from rising to her full potential. And now he stands back and he waits for the third penny to drop. That there must be a reason that God would want to do that. And that reason, of course, is that I, Eve, must really be quite special to pose that kind of threat to God. That's it. That's why he wants to keep me in the dark, because I pose a threat to him. And she doesn't even notice the button that Satan quietly presses here. The woman was convinced, the fruit looked so fresh and delicious, and it would make her so wise. Yes, I'll be so wise. God is keeping me down, but I'm not going to be limited by that. And you know, Satan plays on our pride all the time. The most common tactic he uses is to get people to falsely praise us. Now, honest praise is one thing, but when he uses it to flatter us, when it's not really deserved. Well, as Proverbs 29 verse five says, to flatter people is to lay a trap for their feet. How is that? Well, as Proverbs 27 verse 21 says, the purity of silver and gold can be tested in a crucible, but a man is tested by his reaction to men's praise. How we react when people praise us is every bit as much of a test of our character as how we react when the arrow of low self-esteem goes in. In some ways, it's more of a test. Now, if that was certainly the case for Eve, Satan convinced her that she must be a threat to God, that if only God had been honest with her and Adam, they would be just like God, knowing everything. Now, that appeals to Eve, the fruit looked so fresh and delicious and would make her so wise. The rest, as they say, is history. This is a very effective button to push in people. How do we know if that button is being pushed? How can we tell if Satan is playing on our pride? Well, here's how. By honestly assessing where we are in comparison to 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 7, which says, what makes you better than anyone else? What do you have that God hasn't given you? And if all you have is from God, why boast as though you have accomplished something on your own? Here's how we do this. Think of your greatest achievement, the thing that Thinking about it gives you the most pleasure. And now imagine that someone is saying that verse to you about your greatest achievement. How does that make you feel? Angry? Affronted? What if you led someone to the Lord, perhaps, and in their baptism testimony, they didn't even mention you? 
Now that happened to me. The first person I ever witnessed to shared the gospel with and they became a Christian and then they, they got baptized and they didn't even mention me in their testimony at their baptism. Unbelievable. Worse than that, someone else had taken my place in the story that this person told. A complete rewriting of, of history. What a, what a nerve. But actually, what it was, of course, was not a nerve. It was pride. My pride. Now, how easy is it to push that button in your life? What do you feel when you think of your greatest achievement and somebody says to you, what makes you better than anyone else, better than anyone else? If God did it, then who are you to boast? How vulnerable are you to Satan pushing the button of pride? How vulnerable are you to Satan pushing the button of low self-esteem? How open are you to succumbing to his exaggeration? Do you, right now, need to come to the place of knowing the truth and allowing the truth to set you free? Set free from pride. Set free from low self-esteem. Be set free from getting sucked in by Satan's exaggerations. We are all trophies of grace. We're all here by God's grace. Knowing the security of that is what putting on the helmet of salvation is all about. Know the truth. And the truth, the truth will set you free. Lord God, I thank you that each and every one of us is a trophy of your grace. Not one of us deserves all the amazing things you have bestowed us with. You have allowed your son to die a death on the cross in our place. You've allowed your son to die that we may live. You have given us a purpose, a destiny, an eternal home in heaven. All of this is ours because of Jesus, your son, dying for us in our place. And that what th that you have given us, eternal life, salvation, because of Christ's death on the cross, it cannot be taken away. But we did not earn it. And so we, we see and we acknowledge Satan just quietly in the background pushing those buttons of pride, of low self-esteem. We see him dripping in the poison of, of exaggeration and lies, of drawing us into that conversation. And Lord, right now, in Jesus' name, we pray, Lord, show us the truth that we may be free. You promise if you know the truth, the truth will set you free. We want to be free to live in the truth of our salvation, live in the truth of our relationship with you, live in the truth of how you see us, live in the truth of our destiny and not be dragged into a conversation with Satan that will seek to rob us of all of these amazing things. So may our helmets of salvation be firmly placed on our heads. Be careful what you think, for your thoughts run your life. Lord, we want to fix our eyes on you, fill our minds with the truth that you, Jesus, are our Lord and Saviour. In you, in Christ, we have the victory, we have a a purpose in life, we have a destiny to rule and reign with you, but it's all by grace through faith. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for this truth in your wonderful name. Amen. 
Wow, amen. Well, you know, the uh, armor of God has one piece uh, that, that is um, to take us onto the offensive. It's one aspect of the armor of God that we're going to look at in the next installment. It's the sword of the spirit with which we take the fight to the evil one. And I hope you can join us next time as we look at this um, last but one installment in this uh, really great series on the armor of God. So have a great week, everyone. See you next time. God bless. <laughs>